I want to welcome John Cumming, who is the chairman of Powder Corp and Crimson Wine Groups. And we want to talk about how John was kind of uh, at ground zero, at least for Park City, when it comes to talking about climate change. You started that conversation in 06, I think it was, and there was an event that was put on in Park City. But what prompted you personally to think that it was time to start the conversation? Fear prompted it more than anything. Uh, I had been at the University of Colorado way back in the 80s uh, and took some classes about environmental science or environmental science classes and there was, I was first made aware then that carbon dioxide was overwhelming the atmosphere and that our use of fossil fuels was accelerating. At the time it was mostly, you know, we discussed it or studied it mostly in the context of peak oil leading to an economic calamity. But there was also this notion that the environment was potentially would be badly damaged with the continuation of that kind of behavior. So I was made aware of that and that's in the mid 80s. And then fast forward many years obviously into the late 90s and early 2000s, um, I was in the business, had been in the business, appreciated mountain sports. And let, let the viewers know what is the business. Uh, Powder operates uh, a bunch of ski resorts um, and some summer camps. And I had dedicated my life to it. I grew up in the mountains, uh, skiing and climbing. And, and I, I really, at the time and to this day, felt like that those experiences had enhanced me and my family and my community. And, and uh, was very idealistically, but nonetheless, I believed that these activities in these places were an enhancement to the world and to our communities and, our, and the people in them. And so I had a personal investment and belief that these were important activities for humankind, if you will. Right. Um, and I believed uh, as a result of that that we had some responsibility to the extent that we were involved in sharing it, the experience. We had some responsibility in looking after it in perpetuity. The mountains, I believed then, I believe now, will be here long after we're gone. Our job is to just curate them and preserve them and share them as broadly as possible. Try not to mess it up. Try not to screw it up, yeah. That's harder, easier said than done in some ways. So in 2006, you were starting to talk about, and the community was tar starting to talk about, uh, snow lines. I think that for us that makes sense, but tell those watching what that might mean. As the climate warms, um, it's obvious and stands to reason that winter would be shorter. Less than. Less than. And as part of that, we'd have snow later in the, in the year and would therefore open later and it would melt out earlier and we therefore close earlier. That's bad for business. But in addition to that, um, that drying process would, uh, would create a, a, an elevation rise, if you will, in the, in the snow line. So the area where permafrost, or not permafrost, but the snow line in, at a ski resort on a mountain would, as the season shortened, likely rise. And so I was worried about, and still am worried about, the lower elevation ski resort uh, communities where, uh, where that warming could change a winter season into a longer mud season. And, and I thought and think that that would inhibit our growth as an industry and potentially would end uh, those feeder resorts you know, existence. And so I, there's just less terrain when less there's terrain, less snow. Less opportunity for people to learn, young people to learn. A lot of those lower, smaller ski resorts who don't have the capital and don't have the elevation, don't have the, you know, and don't have the acreage were going to be put in jeopardy. And I just felt like that was bad for our industry over time. You've engaged other organizations to become a part of this. What are some of those groups that you're a part of and that have become, that have come behind this effort to have ski resorts and recreation areas pay greater attention to climate change? Well, in the beginning, in, in the early 2000s, uh, leading up to that 2006 uh, Save Our Snow event, I had started to, to study as much as I could um, through the National Center for Atmospheric Research and for 
and through University of Colorado. This was all contemporaneous to the uh, Inconvenient Truth. Uh, Al Gore. Act, Al Gore programs. You know, so I, I, I just became involved in, in, in studying and learning and communicating through those channels uh, as much as I could. And then I, I had conversations with the National Ski Areas Associations and the sort of leadership of the larger ski resort companies, both in this community and nationally, and, and just started advocating to anybody who would listen uh, for our responsibility in snow sports to, to, uh, to be involved in a solution. There were some who were in favor of having that conversation, Aspen Skiing Company being one example, and there were others who were not as inclined to, to engage in that. It, it was a bit nebulous in the early 2000s, first of all, still. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's hard. Uh, it was then and it's just as hard today to find and be actively involved in solutions. Um, and there's something to be said for, you know, shoemakers sticking to their last. I had an instinct of my own to say, wait a minute, is this really what we do? Our job is to make our resorts as inviting to as many people as possible. Our job isn't necessarily to blow this bugle from the mountaintops about, about the jeopardy that we were all in. And I think that there's a not irrational argument to be made that, that calling to question or announcing this challenge for our industry might, you know, create over time different movement patterns, vacation patterns. People right. might say, you know, there's no snow left anymore. Anyway, I'm going to Hawaii. Right. That, that's not irrational. It wasn't the solution that felt right to me. Um, I felt like given how much my life had been enhanced in the mountains and how much I felt like I had some responsibility to pay that forward to the world, idealistic but true how I felt. Um, I chose to take another tack. I chose to do what I could to be an exemplar because I felt like um, it was important to me and it had been important to my family. And as I said before, it's important to the families that we share these experiences with. So your business decision came from a moral core of what you felt was something that you couldn't ignore, if I understand all that right? Yes, it was selfish too, right? I mean, I- It was I, a business decision. I would be heavily invested in this lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I'm in this lifestyle, I'm in this business, because I uh, believed and had the opportunity to not just focus on objective measures of success, but also focus on subjective measures of success. Um, that's a luxury that I have had and has played out, uh, thankfully. It gave me and afforded me the opportunity to also say, this is happening. Yes, there was a moral impetus behind it, to be sure, but there was also what I thought to be and continue to believe to be a practical uh, aspect of it as well. I think not acknowledging it and not being a part of the solution is undermining our long-term viability. It's hard to be an enduring industry if we're not aware of and doing everything we can to manage the challenges we're gonna face. And protect what you have. Yeah, so to me, it was both things. It was an idealistic moral thing and it was a practical thing, but I also believe it was sort of a, a perpetuity investment uh, belief and a, and, a, and a sort of a play it forward to my community kind of belief as well, and, and, and that's an economic thing too. I mean, these communities rely on the ski resort industry to survive, and right. there are dozens of businesses who- Hundreds. Hundreds, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dozens and dozens, right? Yeah, businesses many who dozens. Re who rely on the snow. There were other uh, leaders in outdoor businesses, outdoor industries, Patagonia's presidents um, did the 1% for the planet. Those things were sort of percolating at that point as well. Were those influences? <laughs> Absolutely. I, so I, I had been involved in Mountain Hardware, which is a clothing and equipment company, because of my previous life. Uh, in my previous life, I'd been a mountaineering guide. Uh, had been aware of Yvonne Chouinard just as a sort of a you know an exemplar of the of the climbing. Who is the was the president pr of founder, Patagonia? Founder, president, chairman, you know, spiritual leader. Right of our industry and of Patagonia, through, through Patagonia. Uh, I'd been involved in Mountain Hardware. By the time the early 2000s had roll, rolled around, Mountain Hardware was a thing. I had met Yvonne at trade shows, I, I think, or, and I certainly had mutual friends. And so when this whole business was 
becoming more front of mind for me and I was trying to have educate myself as much as possible I felt like I was sort of going to the mountain if you will to go talk to Yvonne about what his thinking was in this regard I knew that they had uh, dedicated some of their company's economic uh, power behind conservation um, they had done, they had started one percent for nature I think by then and so I went to the mountain and I and I went to Patagonia and he was gracious and willing to meet with me um, I asked him a million questions uh, and he answered most of them he, he yeah he did <laughs> I mean he, he's a he's a I haven't seen him since you know this day right so it's a long time ago but you know again he was bigger than life to me right and I still to a lot believe of us, that yes. yeah and a leader in so many ways and idealistic uh, too um, but he was generous for people that he felt were like-minded and had some ability to to influence their environment meaning their sort of cult community environment if you will and so he was very gracious with me it was funny I walk into the Patagonia campus where he's having lunch and he's you know just another employee it's a very egalitarian community um, and I'm walking in and he's three guys in three-piece suits, six feet tall, all looking like they were, you know, FBI agents or whatever, were, were leaving. And I sat down and I was like, who are those guys? And he said, that was Walmart. All and of he, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, it was like the senior, whatever, yes. executive team or something. I'm not sure. And, and he said uh, at the end of our meeting when I was asking him how we might use our platform to help his efforts in this general effort, he said, you know, I was really pessimistic um, and have been really pessimistic. I think we're pretty much screwed. But if those guys do half of what they say they're going to do, there's hope. And I was, and I thought to myself, yeah, well, Walmart for sure moves the dial more than our little company, even our little industry. But we really do have what feels to me to be an influence in communication. I mean, we can talk to people who are participating in these sports that rely on winter you know and rely on cold and I felt like that would be you know a very powerful mechanism to to share our perspective we are headed into a renewal of the Paris Accord if I understand it right our uh, current president has said he will not sign that and I'm sitting here in your home where you have hosted Joe Biden more than once for political fundraisers do you think that we need a change in leadership for there to be a change on the planet? I think that any mechanism that we can use to add to people's awareness of the need is useful. And what I mean by that is what we as a country announced we were exiting the Paris Accord. I did what I often do in, in situations which are personally jarring. I, I try and take a moment and say, all right, I think this is calamitous, but maybe I'm wrong. So uh, what, under what circumstances would I, could I be 180 degrees wrong? How else wrong? could this be? Right. Yeah. And so, and, and so I did that in this can, instance because I've obviously so invested in trying to, to share our industry's insights and, and be involved in being the solution and actively managing it and so on. Um, I said, okay, what if that's 180 degrees wrong? And how, what, if, what if these efforts that I'm trying to encourage are 180 degrees wrong? What would that look like? Um, it could look like this isn't the thing, and you're just wrong and alarmist. That doesn't, didn't feel right to me at all. Um, but what did feel right is maybe this is genius. Maybe, maybe the science is clear enough for individuals to decide to do their own right thing. Without the government. Right. And maybe the fact that the government is abdicating all responsibility for setting standards that encourage these behaviors, maybe that's the most efficient way to get people to ch change their own behavior. And I thought to myself, that would be a really terrific outcome. And I still believe that. I think the more that we discuss it, no matter what our position may be politically, um, the harder it is to deny. 
And the more impetus we all gain as individuals to put a freaking solar panel on your house. I'm not, I know I'm not <laughs> supposed to say that. You can say that. Or to drive an electric <laughs> car. Or the next time we buy a car, buy right. one that gets a much better gas mileage. To the be next, thoughtful and to intentional. To be thoughtful. Next time we need a window, we put a triple pane in. This isn't hard. This is just about people having the impetus to change their environment accordingly. And any way that we can that we can make it known that that is a responsibility that we hold individually is good. And so when we dropped out of Paris, as I said, I was jarred by that, but I quickly came to the conclusion that in the end of the day, we don't know how that's going to play means. out. We don't know. It made me buy more solar panels. That was good. <laughs> So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about John the farmer. You farm grapes. Ah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> which was not something that you started doing no. when you were doing the ski business. No, so no, explain no. how that came into your world. Yeah. So uh, my father was a was a Wall Street guy, very successful, and uh, one of the many companies he got involved in was a was a company called Crimson Wine Group, that included when he first started it was two wineries. When my father uh, was getting older and his health was failing him, um, he decided to resolve his company. Um, but the wineries were sort of a, a labor of love to him and his business partner. And we were a little inconsistent with a lot of the sort of m more Wall Street-like investment banking kind of his activities. Portfolio. They, they, yeah. His portfolio. His so, portfolio. So he and his partner decided they were going to spin it off to the shareholders of their company. But uh, because my father's health was ailing, he wasn't going to be able to be chairman, even though he had been. Uh, and we were sitting around, the three of us one day, and, and they said, yeah, we'll spin this off. That sounds good. And John, you're going to run it. And I... Uh, you thought you already had enough to do. I had a job. I felt <laughs> like I had a job. And, um, but, you know, I... I've been chairman now for five years or something, and I've been, I've really enjoyed it. It's very similar to the ski business. Um, it's, it's seasonal. It's seasonal. It's farming, obviously. Um, there's an objective as well as subjective measure of your success. Um, it's very artistic, and, and, uh, and it's very artisanal. And, and it's kind of fun. And it's fun, and the product is, uh, Useful, <laughs> I would say as well. Yes, yes, I would say that. <laughs> Especially lately. From Appreciate your From the central coast of California to Washington State, is that kind of the depth yeah. now of where it is? Yeah. So you're also in the path of a whole lot of wildfires. That's so climate true. change is talking to you in that business just as loudly as it is in the snow business. Yeah, or more so lately. Yeah. Um, and it also changes uh, the, it can change, the flavor of the grape yes. and when the harvest time comes. So tell me a little bit about what climate change is doing to the wine business. If there's a fire that puts uh, ash on your crop, your crop is done, even just a little bit. It's called smoke taint. Um, and, it, and the fires, uh, have had big impact on uh, the quality of the juice that Napa and Oregon and Washington have produced and, and even the central part of, the, of California produced over the last couple of years. It depends on when the fruit comes off. You know, the, right. a fire after you've harvested is no big deal. And vines, it turns out, are really good fire barriers because they don't, they're, they're almost not flammable. They go dormant, they're super hard wood, they're spaced out in, a, in, a, in such a way that it's hard for the fire to, to progress. So, so they're actually kind of good fire blocks. The fruit and the vines, when they're doing their thing, hates the smoke, most of all. Globally, as climate change is happening, there are places now that can grow grapes that never could before. So there was a story not too long ago, I think it was the New York Times, about making champagne in England, yeah. and that it turned out not so bad. Yeah. What, what does that mean to where different places can be to grow different things? How does that change how we live on the planet? Fruit will grow anywhere there's sun and water and soil that will nourish it, you know, the, the vines. Um, and so the wine business has an advantage in climate change, certainly over the ski business, in that they can 
they can alter the re the area, the elevation, the exposure. You know, they can move vines around or or rootstock of vines around and grow in different areas as the climate changes. It's definitely adding to uh, sugar inflation and tannin inflation in in North American wines because heat adds sh heat heat adds sugar in ripening, and so you get a heavier fruit when you have more ripening. I mean, this is a lay person's understanding of it. Um, and so that is happening. Americans like the heavier wines with higher alcohol content. And it turns out ripening enhances both alcohol and flavor and tannin and, and thickens the skins and whatnot. And so those two things are working together. But as, as the climate changes, wineries also have the benefit of being able to Pivot. plant in different e areas. Yeah. Going forward, do glass bottles still make sense in terms of the environment? Like everything in this climate change question, it doesn't have to be binary. You don't have to go from no glass bottles, you know, uh, or, or well, heavy glass bottles, all yeah. glass bottles to no glass bottles. You can, you can use less material. You can lighten them. You can change the way you ship them. You can, you know, there's a, there's a million different ways to manipulate, go to the solution, come to the solution. In a, in a more uh, sort of ra thoughtful, rational, uh, methodical approach. So, specifically, we can use less glass in our bottles. We can use lighter, thinner wall glass in our bottles. We can cork them differently. We can capsule them differently. We can use less materials to do those things. Labeling can be different. You know, we can use different farming practices. So, like in a, like in every other industry, the ski industry too, there are a myriad of things that we can do to accommodate this. And I think that it's important that we understand that in our lives, there are little things that we can do all the time Steps. that accumulate and compound over time. And the ski industry is like that, and the wine industry is like that, and our lives are like that. As I said before, when it's time to buy a new car, buy an electric one. You know, it, we can do this uh, gradually. And I think the more that we understand that, whether it be wine or ski or us personally, that we can do this incrementally and patiently and thoughtfully and still come to the same place, then it, it's less overwhelming for us. You know, like there's been times in this whole discussion environmentally where, where it's easy to get complacent because it's so overwhelming. And flattened, just and, flattened. Yeah, exactly, and yeah. flattened. And I think that adds to polarity because people become depend defensive and, and I, j I, I, I don't, advocate for that in any of the businesses that I'm involved in. I, I think we need to just slowly, incrementally improve, like we call it polishing the stone. We've got to just polish the stone patiently. It'll take our lifetime and beyond before it's perfect, and it may never be. But every little piece that we buff it, every little edge that we take off it, uh, enhances the prospects of our lives for longer. You have uh, three young adult children, or young adults, I should say. A and what is it that you hope they take from where things are now to help move us along to take their role in polishing the stone? You know, I, I can just tell you what I hope to instill in my children. Um, and that is, it's sort of cliche, but my father beat it into my brother and I, and I hope to impress it upon my children <laughs> as well. <laughs> A gentler touch. The, yeah, that, that you know, we are blessed to be here now. We are going to have challenges forever. Our job is to try and improve our environment and leave it better than we found it. If there were one sort of lesson that I hope my children learn watching me, and I sure learned it watching my father, is that to whom much is given, much is expected. And uh, which is cliche, I hope that they recognize that my efforts are to p pay it forward, play it forward, is what is the program we have in powder, and take their responsibility seriously. Um, just being alive today is a blessing. Being alive today in a place like this is beyond Belief. Extraordinary. Being able to live this mountain lifestyle that we live is a gift. 
and and we should recognize that and appreciate it and and take our responsibility seriously to play it forward.